Okay, well, um, continue on our theme of discipleship last Sunday for this. Next week we kind of go into a different series, Covenant and Kingdom. I, I just was reminded today, as a matter of fact, something that happened here when one of our children, how much kids love to play dress up. Don't little kids love to play dress up? Yeah, whether it's shoes or a boa or, or you know, a dress or, or whatever. And it's, uh, you can be Spider-Man or a Batman or a princess. All you got to do is just put some clothes on and, and uh, you know, you're, you're transformed. When I was a little kid, I had hats. I don't know if any of you guys had hats when you were a little kid, but when I was a little kid, I had hats. And, um, you know, I had, like, my cousin gave me an actual army helmet. He was in the guard. And so he lifted one of their army helmets, and I had this real army helmet that I could wear. So when I was playing soldier, I had a real army helmet. I had a Zorro hat. Okay, I would ride my pony and wear my Zorro cape and hat. I had all kinds of baseball caps, uh, Cardinals and the Yankees, sad to say, but uh, had cowboy hats, you know, all these different kinds of hats. And, and when we would go someplace on vacation, that was what I would always ask for. I'd always find a hat in the souvenir store, you know, so I, I had like a three-corner Patriots hat that I could wear, you know, when I was feeling very colonial. And, uh, oh, I had, a, I had a coonskin cap. You know, I see they still sell them out at Sportsman's Warehouse. And, you know, that was how I just got into character of someone else. Well, you're, you're in for a treat today because I, I brought some of my hats. I actually still have hats, and I didn't bring them all. I just kind of brought, uh, this. this is what's called uh, my bobby hat. Not exactly Blues Brothers kind of guy, but this is called the bobby hat because we were in uh, Target one time, and I just put this on, just goofing around, and Chelsea, age three, looked at me and went, bobby hat. And we still don't know what a bobby hat really means. Uh, I don't wear this very much because actually this makes me feel like some guy named Mel that lives in Boca Raton is kind of, you know, what this makes me feel like. But this is my stupid hat, okay? And so then I, I've got, I just brought a couple of others. Um, this, of course, is my, my mossy oak. And this is one of my favorite hats. It fits me perfectly. And when I, I want to feel, you know, like a, a duck hunter or, a, you know, you don't, you don't wear this and, and drive the Honda. You, you drive your truck, all right? And, you know, you kind of scratch a little bit more and talk with a southern slang when you have this hat. But this is one of my favorite hats, right? And I become kind of somebody different. The last one that I brought is, oh, boy, as you can tell, it's Boston, which is, it's even dirty on the inside, but uh, you can't wash this hat too much because there's just not much left of it, you see. And we got this, uh, I might just wear that the rest of this. No, I probably shouldn't do that. <laughs> this is my comfort hat. This is what I put on when I just want to check off the grid, okay? You're in a cabin and you put on, this, this comes from 2002 when we were in Boston, was that about the year? 1999, it's close, within three years, so give or take three years and everything I say. But we, we were in Boston with a family having a great time and we went to Fenway and I got this, this hat and even though I'm not a Boston fan anymore, it still reminds me of, you know, a good weekend and just some great times. And now I've got hat hair probably, but a little bit of hair that I've got. Some of you have shoes or purses. I know that. Some of you got jeans. You know, you get a new pair of jeans and, and that makes you feel differently, you know? You just like, I just, just feel hot because I got some new jeans on, right? Isn't it funny how dressing up can kind of, you know, makes you feel so much different and uh, we somehow feel like we've changed, you know? We step into another personality. We kind of borrow someone's personality. And I'm not bashing that, I, you know, because we all like to do it. I'm just pointing to it because it illustrates kind of an important truth. What if when I put my hat on that I thought that that is actually all that it takes to be a baseball player is to put the hat on? 
or you know you put the Nike hat on and, and all of a sudden you're you're you know Tiger or somebody like that playing the PGA. Now what if I thought that there was something that I could do that would actually do that would make me a different kind of person? You know, maybe something more than a hat. Maybe, uh, you know, if I wanted to have some more friends. Okay, I want more friends, so what could I do to have more friends? Well, what if I had more money? If I had more money, I'd have more friends, wouldn't I? Because I'd be more interesting, I'd have more things for them to play with, and they'd, they'd want to come over to my home, and my, my car would be nicer, my TV would be bigger, I could entertain more, right? Well, maybe, maybe if I had more money, I could have more friends. Uh, Maybe, maybe if what I was lacking was respect, okay, then, then what I could do is, um, and I'm working retail and everybody else is wearing jeans, but I'll just wear a suit. Everybody will think, well, he, he's definitely got, got it together because he's, he's wearing dress-up clothes, big boy dress-up clothes, and we're all, you know, casual every day, and here he is wearing a tie and jacket. Maybe. That, that might work a little bit. They, they might respect me a little bit more. Or maybe what, if what I lack is peace, you know, if I'm the person that, that, that I like, you know, I'm always worried something bad is going to happen, I'm anxious all the time, and I just sit and think about things a lot, then what I need to do in order to change that is my environment. I'll change my environment. Um, I'll, I'll get away. I'll, you know, kind of drop out. I'll get off the grid. I'll turn off the TV, turn off the phone, turn off the Internet. You know, maybe then I'll have peace. Well, maybe, right? Just a little bit. Maybe just a little bit. You see, in all those scenarios, what we're assuming, uh, the proposition is that life is to be lived from the outside in. That we can do something on, with, with ourselves, with our bodies, that will actually change what's inside of us. And, you know, th there's a little bit of truth in there with our, what we put in our mind, and so we'll have an effect on us, but maybe, maybe you're here today and you don't want to change anything. Maybe you're just cool right the way you are, you know. You, you might check with somebody about that before you go too much further. <laughs> you know, maybe some family or friends, or if you have a spouse, that's always a good person. You know, it's, honey, do you think there's anything that I need to change? And you'll find out differently. But I want to bring this topic up today because last week, as we were uh, in this little discipleship series, uh, our learning came from what it means to follow Jesus because... Um, in the last part of that message, I talked about how following Jesus means that our actions will change. And, and I mean, that's so true, that, that if we follow him, that we're going to behave differently. But, <coughs> we, and we're fools to think that if we don't change our actions some, that, that that's a good thing, because we imitate him. But, but the minute that we go to those actions, we remember that as human beings, so that we're prone to thinking that we can change ourselves from the outside in. We try to fake it until we make it. we thinking about, you know, that if we look like followers, we act like followers, that we are actually followers. It's, you know, kind of changed by osmosis where you just get around some Christians for a while and it just kind of sinks into you and you talk like them and you act like them and then you become one of them. And that's from the outside in. That's not the way that Jesus says that it works, and we know from experience that it doesn't work either. The way that he described it, there's an inner world and there's an outer world, and the two are connected. Um, they're not completely separate from each other. Our environment does infect, uh, affect excuse me, our inner world, and there's a life that we are living with the Father that no one can really see, and then there's this external life that everybody can see. And Jesus said, remember, he said, God is a spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And that means that we can't fake it to, to really worship him. And it has to be in the spirit, which is unseen. Now, Jesus told a parable um, about this, and it was directed to a group of people who lived completely from the outside in. And they thought that uh, life flowed inwardly, and all that was important was on the outside. So we're going to Matthew 23, 25 to 28. 
Jesus says how terrible it will be for you legal experts and Pharisees, hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and plate, but inside they are full of violence and pleasure-seeking. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside of the cup will be clean too. How terrible it will be for you legal experts and Pharisees, hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs. They look beautiful on the outside, but inside they are full of dead bones and all kinds of filth. In the same way, you look righteous to people, but inside you are full of pretense and rebellion. Well, he uses these two illustrations, and they work great in his day, and they kind of work in ours. They need a little bit of unpacking. First, he says, your people... You're like people that wash the outside of the cup, but you don't worry about the inside. And I think we get that on a hygiene, sanitation. Um, it's a little bit about a little bit more than that in their context. In their context, it was more than sanitation. The, the Pharisees and these legal experts in this translation, or scribes as they're often called, uh, had specific ways that washing was done. And so before they went to the synagogue, before they went to temple, they had, they had these ritualistic washings that they did, baptisms really. And they would walk through these tanks before they went in. And before they ate, they had rit- ritualistic hand washings. They had uh, these rituals, these ceremonies to wash all of their plates because they thought that anything on the outside could defile them on the inside. And that was what the whole, it was all symbolic, but, but it really was, that was what they were working off of. And um, Jesus didn't do those things, you know, and he used these practices, uh, which he did not observe, to teach them about living from the inside in. And, and, you know, this verse 26, first clean the inside of the cup so that the outside of the cup will be clean too. That's not about sanitation. He's talking about more than that. So he's saying, you know, the way you live, and that you try to connect with God is just as silly as just cleaning the outside of your cup and the inside has got all kinds of yesterday's junk in it, you know. Then he used this practice uh, to make his point even more. He, he used the, the burial practices to make it even a, a greater point. And, and in their day, the, the Jewish law prohibited them from coming in contact with someone that was dead if they if they did, then they couldn't go to temple and they couldn't go to synagogue because they were ritualistically uh, unclean. And so their practice was was that in the spring, um, they had these ossuaries, they're called, are the kind of vernacular is the bone box. But in, in the Jewish practice of burial, a person was, was put into a tomb for a year and then at the year anniversary, they took what was left, the bones, and put it in the family bone box, an ossuary. And right outside of Jerusalem in the Kidron Valley, the whole valley is covered with all of these limestone boxes above the ground. But even out in Galilee and beyond, those boxes were many different places. And, and right before Passover, they had the practice of taking whitewash, uh, cheap paint, and they would paint all these so people would see them and not come in contact with them so they could go to temple during Passover. So, so they wouldn't make just a you know, bad mistake and come close to one touch it and then not be able to go. So that's what he's talking about. And he says, you're like whitewashed tombs. You know, you, they look good on the outside, but inside they're dead. In, in construction, sometimes you'll hear, uh, oh, there's nothing wrong with that that a coat of paint won't fix, right? You've heard that said before. I've, I've had a couple instances where um, somebody had given a coat of paint to something. Um, we were selling a house. Uh, wasn't ours, but uh, as we got to poking around in one of the closets, it looked okay for a while, and he started pushing on the drywall. I thought, hmm, this got soft in there, you know, and, and tore the dark drywall out, and the whole wall was rotten because there had been a leak up above, and the ice had come in and rotted this wall. So, you know, looked okay. Should have sold it as was, right? Don't touch it. Just leave it alone. Just, just sell it the way it is, but slap a coat of paint on it. That was the message of Jesus to the Pharisees. He said, you're living from the outside in. You look so good. But on the inside, you see, it's dead. They, they had this practice of enlarging certain things as signs in their day that they were very, 
religious, people would say to them, oh, these people are really, really following after God because look at them. Man, I mean, uh, they had been instructed in the book of Numbers uh, to put tassels, four tassels on the bottom of their, their garments, the men were. And these tassels, one on each corner, when they used to have just kind of a, a one piece with a hole in the top of it that they would hang over themselves. And these tassels were to remind them of the law. Well, the Pharisees said, little tassel works good. Think how much a medium tassel. Ooh, and then he's got a medium one. I can make mine bigger. Next thing you know, they got these huge tassels, you know, hanging from their clothes. And Jesus comes down on them, you know, pretty hard uh, about that. And then they had what were called uh, phylacteries. And this actually comes from Scripture. And uh, the Lord said, you know, bind my word on your head and on your arm. They took it literally. And they made these little, yeah, like this guy right here. Still do it. Orthodox Jews still do this. For prayer time, the men will put their phylacteries on. It's a little leather box that has a little scroll in it that has some important Jewish passages on their head and on their arms. The Matthew 23, 5, Jesus says, you've enlarged your tassels and you've enlarged your phylacteries. And at their time, they had these great big huge boxes up here, you know. Well, you want to look really, I'm really, really trying. See, so I've got this gigantic box. It'd be like if us, if, if we had this, this, this cross that was hanging, you know, like right here. On, I'm really, really religious. You know, it's like this big. Bar barely just get it around us. Jesus comes down on pretty hard. Much of his criticism of the scribes and the Pharisees uh, concerned their hypocrisy. We get that. Um, uh, they were fakes, and they were whitewashed tombs, as he says, and it's all show. Uh, when they wanted to pray, they did it very loudly. Uh, when they wanted to give money, they would have trumpets sound before they put their money in so everybody could see how dedicated they were and how much money they were giving. And Jesus said, you're doing all this just to be seen, but you're empty on the inside. He said, I don't know you. You're cleaning the outside of the cup. You're just putting on your bobby hats is all that you're doing and faking it here for a while, you know. And it's easy for us just to stop right there and say, oh, okay, uh, we just don't want to be hypocrites. But uh, there's more here that Jesus is trying to teach them and us. He's, he's not just condemning hypocrisy. He's also giving them and us a new way, a life lived from the inside out. There's a difference, you see, between our person and our personality. And most of the time we think about our personality, you know. We, we tend to emphasize the personality. That's what everyone else can engage and see. But God emphasizes the person, the person that only he can see. And that's who we really are. And what or who we are is really secret for the most part except to God. And Jesus teaches this, this new way, this unseen way. So I want to read another passage here from Matthew. It's earlier in the book, back in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 6, 1 to 6. He says, be careful that you don't practice your religion in front of people to draw their attention. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father who's in heaven. Whenever you give to the poor, don't blow your trumpet as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may get praise from people. I assure you, that's the only reward they'll get. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that you may give to the poor in secret. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners so that people will see them. I assure you, that's the, the, the only reward they'll get. But when you pray, go to your room, shut the door, Pray to your Father who is present in that secret place. Your Father who sees what you do in secret will reward you. Now, the reward that he's talking about isn't, okay, Don, you, you spent 15 minutes every day of this month with me in secret, so your 401K is going up, you know, or, or UK is going to win the national championship. That's, that's not the reward 
that he's talking about. The reward is, is the development, the growth that we have from the inside out. And the relationship that I'm seeking grows and develops in the things of God are just no longer a burden. It's, it's no longer work, but it's joy, you know, that he gives us. And I began to distinguish his voice. And, and now instead of having difficulty making a lot of decisions, I just, just know I'm saying I, like, like all of us would. I'm not saying that this is just me or this is me. But when, when we spend time with him and uh, give him that secret place, then just life, the reward is that life becomes uh, really directed by him. Remember the passage in John 10 that we read before communion? Uh, my sheep listen to my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So we really only know Jesus and hear his voice to the degree that we know him in secret. For us to be effective in following him uh, and leading others, uh, we must have character and competency. And that's not a difficult thing to understand. Character is the inner life. Character uh, is who we are when we're alone. And only Jesus can form that. Only Jesus can form our inner person. Competency isn't a bad thing. Competency is a very good thing. Competency is, is the knowledge that we have of his word or the experience that we have with him of following him. But for us to be effective, both of these are necessary. Character on the inside and competency on the outside. For us to be effective, they, we have to have both, and we have to have both of them, And because competency without character is just dangerous. And um, we will likely do big things that are the wrong things because we don't hear that shepherd's voice. We, we need both. And no one can teach us character. Only God can form it in us. Now, when I was thinking about this character formation, uh, I thought about something I never thought about before, and that is the Apostle Paul, and you know, just a real brief illustration from his life. Remember, Paul had a lot of competency. He was a persecutor of the Jews, or excuse me, of the Christians. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, a very competent Pharisee, and he was persecuting the Jew. Uh, the I keep saying Jake, persecuting the Christians. And then one day he was on his way to Damascus, and Jesus, the risen Lord, revealed himself to him, and, and Saul, as he was, became Paul. And when he finally gets his sight back after that, uh, we're not really sure what happens to him. As a matter of fact, we have a two-year period. We're not sure where Paul goes. Um, we know he was in Arabia, but we don't have any history there. But the next time that we see him, uh, Barnabas is taking him to the disciples. And if you pay attention, Paul actually knows more about Jesus than these men who walked with him for 12 years, or for three years, these 12 men who walked with him for three years. He, he emerges, he knows more about Jesus. And, and what's proposed oftentimes is that those two years were spent of him in a desert place in isolation with Jesus forming his character. He just abiding in him in secret. Didn't go to be schooled by any of the disciples. Jesus does the inner formation of Paul. And if we want to be used by God for a great purpose, then it must be from the inside out. It can't be from the inside, outside in. Another way to look at it is being versus doing. I mean, I'm just addicted. Most of us are addicted just to doing things. And, and action is so important, but, but never at the neglect of being. The doing should come after the being. The old saying is, don't just do something, stand there, right? There's times when we need to stop our doing and just be with the Lord. Um, that's inside out. That's uh, being first and then doing next. Uh, the doing is to arise out of us being with Jesus. It's seen to develop uh, the seen from the unseen. But if you're like me, you know, I, I just, I'm just much more comfortable with doing something rather than doing nothing. I'm not talking about being lazy. I mean, silence, solitude, 
leaving space, man, you know, it's, it's not something that most of us just run to. We, we really resist this. And if I can stay busy at something, then I, I don't notice my lack of incompetence or my discouragement. But when we do that, Jesus says we're just neglecting the inside of the cups. You know, we're, we're cleaning the outside, our, but our inner lives, we're, we're neglecting that. So if you want to be a disciple, if you want to be a pupil of Jesus, then you must move from the inside out. We have to first give him the time and uh, the opportunity to form us inwardly. It has to begin with character. There's no other way. And we can hang around the church our, our whole lives and quite honestly never hear this because uh, the church institution um, and, and human beings, all of us, we gravitate towards this. We focus on doing most of the time. What are we going to do? What program are we going to move in? Rather than this, this inner formation. Now, uh, you would not be unusual if uh, you walked out of here and said, I don't have the slightest idea what he's talking about, you know. Um, that, that's just, what was that? Uh, you know, I was, I was making my grocery list for lunch while he was doing that whole thing. And, I mean, I can give a prayer, I can teach a class, I can lead a mission event, but I don't, for the life of me, have the, any idea what he's talking about, you know. Is this quiet time? Is he telling us we need to have more quiet time? Is he telling us we need to do Bible study more? Uh, I mean, is this worship? Uh, kind of like the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus and says, Lord, what thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, that's where most of us have been living in the church. It really is. Well, what thing must I do? And I want, I want to put something up. I stole this from somebody. He was a better thinker than I am. And, and probably had much more character development than I. But he said this. He said, we need people who want to be with Jesus for the sake of being with Jesus. Do you get that? We don't go to be with Jesus to get something. But we just want to be with Jesus for the sake of being with Jesus. Anything else is just trying to get something that we want. And, and only God, you know, by his Holy Spirit can, can give us that desire. It begins with him, you know. He speaks to us. He calls us. He gives us this desire. And maybe we're here today and we're going, you know, I don't know. Um, I don't know exactly how to do this. Most of us don't know how to do this, all right? And that's a good thing. Uh, getting to the point that we don't know how to do something opens up the door for God doing something in us most of the time. But if you have the desire to have more desire, I think that's where it starts. I think God gives us the desire to have more desire for him. And when we begin with that, then that's from God. Uh, just a couple things here to, to close up. Um, I, I do know that you have to give him opportunity. You know, you, you have to stop long enough to give him opportunity. Uh, years ago when I was uh, a young Christian and uh, in beginning uh, kindergarten class with Jesus, um, the op I had a lot of more opportunity probably even than, than what I do today. I was farming and I have these mindless hours of sitting on a tractor back and forth and back and forth. I don't know, you know, and it's just, you know, what a menial task that is to go all day, sit on a tractor back and forth. But boy, God did some work in me because I had all that time. And, and I know my neighbors thought I was nuts every once in a while because I'd be driving the tractor down the the row, standing up with my hands raised, just giving Jesus praise, you know, some days, and they're going, I don't know, he's, I think he's drinking again, you know, because <laughs> he's, he's, he's doing it again. But, but I had that opportunity just, just now, now I have to focus on giving God that opportunity. So, so maybe if you're going, I don't know how to do this, I hear what he's saying, I need to live from the inside out. I think that's where I'd start, is, is focusing on, sometimes we always have to give something up to make room for more, okay? So, so this would be the place where I would start, would be to give God some opportunity, have some time to have a secret place with him. And then the, the, the next thing that I would, would give you a hint on, if you were trying to get to know a new friend, how would you approach that with a new friend, with Jesus as a new friend? Would you uh, try to talk to him and text at the same time? 
Okay? Would you sit with your new friend and just, you know, kind of give him casual uh, conversation? Or would you be intent with this person to find out who they are and find something out about them? So, so an openness, a, a vulnerability to actually speak to Jesus the way that we would speak to a person if he were in that room with us is, is often a good place to start to open up um, life from the inside out. Just a couple of hints there. Well, let's, let's sit for a minute in prayer and then we'll go on and praise. As deep cries out. 